So today, what I want to get through, what I want to, well, today what we're going to talk about is we're going to talk about uh, the changes in social class, how social class changes. So this is sort of like, if you will, kind of a quick, dirty history of social class, particularly in Western nations uh, since the Middle Ages. So. Um, and how we see it changing today, how it changed in the past, what's the relevance of that. Um, so um, just to also tell you guys, like uh, a lot of this is coming out of uh, an area of academia referred to as Marxism. I'm sure you, have you guys heard of Marxism? What do you associate with Marxism as people who haven't been in college? Socialism. You associate with socialism, what else? Communism, yeah, like most people in their minds, when they hear the name Karl Marx, they go to like the revolutionary Marxist of like the, you know, early 19th century, you know, dressed in drab green, like, you know, taking over countries, right? Like that's kind of where people go. Does anybody know how most people in academia use Karl Marx? As some philosopher from the 19th century. Karl Marx is one of the most common philosophers of the 19th century, one of the most influential. And regardless of what discipline you're in, you're probably going to hear about him, especially if you're in the humanities or the social sciences. So, um, so you know, don't let that throw you. I'm also going to use some of the words that are like words that often like you'll hear like in your association probably with communism, but I'm not by no means sitting up here promoting the overthrow of the government and the placement of some, some authoritarian regime. And going back to like, that's not how most people use Marx, especially today, so. Marxism, Marxism is probably the first major theory of social class, so it has a huge influ influence on anything uh, that has to do with inequality. That's gonna be true of their studies of race, it's gonna be true for Things like next week we're going to talk about colonialism. All the most of this sort of ideas are influenced by Marxism in one way or another because it gets us thinking about how is it that the economy changes over time, right? We don't assume that the economy is something stagnant in Marxism, which is why people pull to it as an explanation, right? It's something changing. Okay, which gets us to like when we think of social classes, like most things in our lives. This is a phrase I, I, I've already thrown around a lot. We have a tendency to transhistoricize it, right? We have a tendency to assume that social classes and differences of inequality largely existed looking the same now as it did in the past, which isn't really all that true, right? There, is, oh, there has always been inequality, but inequality works differently depending on how your economy is structured. So we've seen changes throughout particularly modernity. By the way, when I use the word, I've used this word a lot already, modernity. What do I mean by modernity? When does modernity start and how it's often used in the social sciences? Has anybody caught on to this? It starts a little earlier than most people think of, because most people often use the word modern to mean today. Uh, modern is a little bit further back. Uh, 1600 is often, if you want to think about that, whenever I say the word modern, that's usually what I'm meaning by it. Uh, that becomes really important because a lot of the systems that were built are built during this period of modernity. So a lot of what we live in now, there's questions about whether we still live in modernity or not. It's a question for another day, right? But that's usually how it's used. Don't you talk about being in a postmodern society a lot? Yes, yes, so that's the question is like can, and we can get to some of those questions today if we really want to towards the end, like can you categorize what we live in now as being the same as the modern? Uh, and that's really kind of the question where you get into something called postmodernism. Postmodernism is any theory, you're going to hear it used differently sometimes, but as a, as a general rule, postmodernism is any theory that posits that we no longer live in modern times. Um, Sometimes people treat it like it's uh, some sort of philosophy of like uh, basically like anything goes, like believe whatever you want. That's not really an accurate portrayal of postmodernism because there's some things of postmodernism that are very scientific that are right. Postmodernism is simply a statement that we no longer live in the modern. Right? And a good chunk of people within academic circles are no longer going to want to analyze us as living in the same thing as the 19th century. Right, which I think is fair, right? 
Um, not to say that I'm a postmodernist, but I think that that makes a lot of sense, that things have changed since then. Okay, any questions so far? Cool. So to get us kind of thinking about changes in social class, I want us to kind of pause it. You know, I'm not expecting you guys to be historians and know the past perfectly, but I want us to kind of do a thought experiment if we pause it, like, what might be different groups of people if we were to go back for modernity? So in this case, like a lot of us have some vague understanding of what the Middle Ages is like from watching television, right? So like if we go back to the Europe Middle Ages, like what sort of groups of people do you find existing? Like peasants and nobles. Yeah, yeah, you got nobles and you have peasants. Those are two important classes. Does anybody know a different name for nobles? We often refer to nobles as the aristocracy. Does anybody know what the nobles do for money? What they do for a living? Like own land and then collect the rents from the people that live in Yep. So their nobles' wealth are tied to property. So they're the property class. What else do they do? What else does the aristocracy do in the Middle Ages? We can think about some other groups, because there's some groups of people that we automatically associate with the Middle Ages that are also nobles. Aristocrats. What other groups of people might we have? Like they serve on parliament and other political branches? <clears throat> yeah, yeah. So they're also the ones that govern. They govern. The nobles are in charge, right? At the lower level, you have lords. As you move up, like those are all those rankings, right, that people used to have, right? You could be a you know, duke or an archduke or whatever, right? Like there's this very set structure in which people were hierarchically, like different parts of the nobility, all the way up to people who were the kings of the country, right? So all this would be the nobles or the aristocracy. By the way, just as an aside, how powerful are kings in the Middle Ages? Does anybody know this? Because we often have misconceptions about this. They're not. Power is what they call decentralized. So like, basically, like, generally speaking, like, the person who runs a country doesn't have their own army. They can't really force anybody to do anything. Right, they essentially are dependent upon groups of lords or other nobles to actually do anything. Right, so like, really, it's the nobles that kind of run the country, and power is sort of dispersed out from outside of them. There's one other group of people that are also nobles or aristocracy that we think of in the Middle Ages. Anybody think of what it is? Clergy. Oh no, clergy aren't aristocracy. They're from all kinds of. They're a separate group them in here. There is different power source. They're important in the Middle Ages, but they're they're drawn from all the different classes. Who else do we associate with the Middle Ages? Possibly on horseback. Knights. Yeah, so essentially your military is also your comes from this class, right? So so this class owns property, that's where they get their money, they govern, and they're the military. Right? They're a military class. You said one other group of people. Uh, peasants. peasants. Right? What do peasants do? Yeah. So the people who are tied to the land of the nobles are called peasants. So, how free are peasants? What do you think? What, what does it mean to be a peasant? So you have to work. What do you have to do? 
besides farm. Can you move around? Go pick up a different profession? No, you're tied to the land, right? So like whoever owns that land, right, essentially can exact what's called tribute from you, which is essentially whether the lords get their money. Essentially, the military groups, uh, the, the nobles, right, they fight amongst themselves, stealing land from one another. The peasants kind of stay wherever they're at. And they generally don't kill the peasants. They try not to anyways, unless there's like a peasant revolt or something like that. By and large, what they do is they just sort of like kill each other across the countryside, take over groups of peasants, and that's how they compete with one another, right? Okay, we talked about the clergy, right? Clergy are drawn from all classes. There are different power sources in the Middle Ages. We'll see them wane in power in the modernity, right? They no longer held as much political sway as they once did. Okay. There's, another, there's other groups of people. Can anybody think of something else you might do in the Middle Ages? Yeah, artisans. So what do artisans do? They make things, right? Has anybody ever heard of the guild? Do people know what this is? You might have like, guilds are like organizations of people. So as an artisan, you cannot just sort of like ask. Like, you don't sell things in the same way. So, like, now prices are largely governed by basically whatever you can sell it as, right? Uh, instead, in the Middle Ages, prices were set by guilds. And guilds are just a collection of artisans, and they're also the ones who determine who can make what. So if you're not a member of a guild and you make something, so let's say like, uh, let's say that we are we want to be silversmiths or something like that, right? We make silver. Um, you get caught making silver by a guild, and you're not gilded. They'll just kill you. That's generally how it works. So the only people who can make things are people who belong to the guild. They can only sell it at the prices made by the guild, and they can only make it to the standards that the guild allows them. To Right, so like, that's essentially how how artisans work. Right, there's one more group of people, and it's that we have a merchant class. Right, and the merchant class is sometimes quite wealthy, but usually looked down on by the nobles and don't have as much power. Right, and so there's an antagonism between those people who rule and the merchants. And the merchants simply trade things, basically. So they're the ones who ship things from place to place, stuff like that. Right? Make sense? Obviously, is this the system we have today? No. We have a different economy. It works differently. So what are our social classes? What kind of work do we have? What kind of work can you do today? What sort of jobs do people have? Anything. Like a blue collar job or a white collar job? Yeah, you could have a white collar job. What you would normally call middle class. What do what does a white collar job do? What do middle class people do? What sort of things? Business. What's that? Business. Uh, business, it depends on your level of business, right? You might be above being being middle class, right? Like, if you're wealthy enough, you're not actually middle class. You're something else, right? You're upper class. So, like, if you're thinking about something like a businessman, like, I don't know, somebody who sells insurance, right? That person's middle class. If you're thinking about a businessman as in, like, I'm the CEO of... General Motors, right? Then no, you're not middle class, right? You're something else. You're upper class. Okay, what other sort of middle class jobs do you have? Most of you guys are trying to be middle class, right? Teachers. 
teachers, doctors, right? Architects, engineers, right? Any of these jobs are all, all middle class jobs, right? Uh, middle class jobs, you rarely own things. You rarely own things, right? You might, uh, um, you generally work for. someone else, right? So blue collar jobs, what might be an example of a blue collar job? Wait, I have a question about yeah. that. So I, I feel like this might be an argument for the fact that we might be in a postmodern society because the middle class of so many people are doing their own businesses now, working from home, working. they don't work, they do work for themselves now, they don't have a boss. Yeah. It's like the whole like entrepreneurship kind of movement. Yeah. So and they're still probably considered middle class. So good example. Okay. So and I'm d doing a division of class depending on job, right? So there's actually an intermediate category here. So if we were to do I'm gonna change the terms that we're using. So I'm gonna use the term bourgeoisie to mean wealthy people, right? So I told you that this is based off of Marxism, right? So the bourgeoisie are the owning class. As in like they own large things, right? Things that other people work for. Getting back to the idea of the gig economy, which is what you were talking about, right? Which is that people own, will essentially work for themselves. There's something within the there's something that's not really bourgeoisie, as in you don't own, but you also don't work for anybody. And you'd refer to this as petite bourgeois. So you could be petite bourgeois, a little bourgeoisie. Or essentially you own your own labor, right? So you own your own, but you don't now own anybody else's. So, so you own your own labor, but you do not own other people's, right? So, I sometimes refer to myself as, as like, somewhat offhandedly as being white trash because I grew up kind of poor, but my dad actually was self-employed. So my father would have been petite bourgeoisie. He didn't have a lot of constraints on his work. Right, but he, he, he hand paints signs for people for a living. Right, he doesn't have a lot of constraints on his work. He doesn't have a lot of money either. But he doesn't have some boss telling him what to do. And essentially that's kind of the essence of being a petite bourgeoisie. This could be, we could make an argument that some people in the gig economy are this. This would be like people who I don't know, like make koozies and sell them on Etsy for a living. Right, or something like that. But there are also people who, I don't know, do something like run Uber driver, drive, you know, you know, work for Uber, and those people would not be petite bourgeoisie because Uber actually owns their labor, right? They sold it, right? So, so that's a difference, right? Make sense so far? Okay, what other, we're gonna call, now we're gonna call blue collar people proletariats since we switched to this. I was gonna translate that eventually anyways, but just so you, these are terms you should probably know. So proletariats work for somebody, right? Proletariats in the Marxist system would be both the middle class and the working class. So like a good example would be, you know, I don't necessarily own my own labor, right? So like in some ways I'm kind of similar to other workers, but not really because I make more money, right? Because it's not a system built on money, it's a system built on how, how much you control what you're doing. Make sense? So what would be working class jobs? This is also something that 
we often get a little confused about what are working class jobs? What may be an example of a working class job? Construction worker. A construction worker. Yeah. What else? What's up? A janitor. A janitor, yeah. A janitor still, yeah, would be working class. What else? Like mechanics. Mechanics, yeah. What, what, what group of working people might not be working class? Because not everybody who is outside of the working class, right, doesn't work. So somebody like, like people who like, I don't know, work at a convenience store, or work at McDonald's, like really low wage stuff are instead referring to as working poor. So they're the working poor. And the working poor are part of the lower class. And Marxists speak the lumpen proletariat. Okay, so obviously two very different systems, right? How do you think we get from one to the other? Does anybody know, have any idea of this? Like, good example, like if we start with the nobles, does anybody know what happens to their aristocracy? Or the nobility. Because the relationship between the nobility and the poor are very different from the relationship between the upper class and the poor. So, and same with the artisans and etc. So, so with the nobility. People live on their land, but they also have to. This is something referred to as paternalism. So within the, this system, essentially, like, and this is we should think out. Like we're sort of trained as moderns to look back on the Middle Ages and hate it, and it's not really good, useful to think about class class structures or the way in which we organize states or anything like that as good and bad. Like there's kind of ups upsides and downsides to every system, right? Nobody's actually gotten how to take care of people, right? Um, so in, under the noble system, you don't have a lot of control in terms of where you live or what kind of job you do, but you do have control over certain other things, and you're also protected by other things, right? So in some, to some degree, the nobles have to like paternally look out for you in some way, right? So your standard of living is not supposed to drop be below a certain level. And they build in all kinds of protections. Um, so one kind of protection is something called the commons. So, um, so a good example of how the system works, let's say like you have a time in, I don't know, it's plague or famine or whatever, right? And things have gotten really bad. Essentially, what you can do is you can stop farming if you have to. You know, if you're not growing any crops, then you can essentially just extract things from most of the land, which is called held in common. So it's owned by the lords, but nobody has any use rights over it. But anybody can use it, right? Does it make sense? So you get to hunt, you get to use lumber, you get to, most of the things you do on a day-to-day -day basis to survive comes out of these commons that are shared and anyone can access them. Do we have any land that's held in common anymore? If you want to just chop down a tree and build a house someplace, can you do that? No. But in this system, that's very much so possible, right? Your housing, as a peasant, you don't have to provide your own housing. It's provided for you, right? So there's this language of taking care of people that came along with this system, right? And part of that is, is peasants can't get up and move away, right? So they really do have to be taken care of, or they just would cease to exist as a population. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So like if you if you grew up and your parents had rights to the land, they could have been horrible farmers, 
it doesn't really matter. They have rights to the land, and they're allowed to use it. So those are like, the Lord can't revoke your rights as peasants, right? So this is kind of the weirdness of the system, right? Work is guaranteed, but it's not necessarily always very profitable or pleasant, right? Certain, like, certain, the things you need to survive are guaranteed, right? And actually, like, if lords stop doing that, generally they get killed by their peasants because the peasants outnumber them. Uh, that's the, the things like, are called, they call them peasant revolts. They happen all the time, right? So, like, let's say you have a particularly, like, mean lord who's just going to tax the crap out of you and, like, force you into starvation. Well, they just kill them. And that's essentially what happens, and then some other lord in his family takes his place, and then things just go back to normal, usually, right? So there is a weird protection in the system that's very different, right? So do we have nobles anymore? Do you have somebody who paternalistically owns your land, you pay tribute to, takes care of you, provides you with commons? Is this something? Do you have use rights that persist forever, can't be alienated, you can't sell it. No. What do you think happens to the, do we have lords over us anymore? Do we have any aristocracy at all anymore? No, the aristocracy dies out completely, right? It gets either absorbed, it either gets absorbed into this class, or this class, or this class, and a little bit of all of it. So the aristocracy disappears. They're kind of wiped off the face of the earth in a lot of ways. Why? This is a history you guys know. You just don't, haven't talked about it in these terms. So like, why is it that we don't have a king in the United States? You guys know this. And so we wouldn't have been in charge when that when we made that decision that we wanted people to have that, right? Like we would just would have been some merchants sitting over here in a colony, right? What happened to make that possible? Revolution. The revolution, right? In Marxist language, they refer to these as the bourgeois revolutions. So the bourgeois revolutions got rid of the aristocracy. So the aristocracy either had to adapt or it just dissipated into working class, like what would be called like sort of working proletariat professions, especially middle class ones, doctors, lawyers, things like that. Right? So that's often what happened. So essentially they disappeared. So they're no longer a part of the structure. Instead what happened is this class became this class. So essentially you have the bourgeoisie is essentially the merchants, right? So the merchants sort of seized power in the bourgeois revolutions, and then they became the upper class, right? They took the position from the aristocracy. And in doing so, they built a very different system, right? Uh, so thinking about, like, in this system, how did you get your job? We already alluded to it. What's that? You're born into it. You're born into it. Your family did it, right? So, like, if this was the system rather than in place today, you know, I would probably be a farmer. You know? Uh, well, I think farmers would be petite bourgeois. But anyways, I'd probably be a farmer, right? Because my descendants are farmers. That are a factory worker, right? Um, and that's essentially, like, how it worked, right? So you were born into something, and that, was, that controlled what your options were. You might not have the exact same job. So, like, if your father was an artisan, you might not be an artisan. Of course, if you were a woman, you didn't have a profession usually. Um, but uh, you know, if you were, if your father was an, a mason, you might be able to become, you know, a blacksmith, you know, or something like that. So it's not what a one-to-one -one relationship, but you stayed within your own class. You inherited it. How do you get work today? What's that? So you pick your job. What, how do you pick a job? You, do you just get to like declare yourself something? Today I'm a surgeon. <laughs> what will all you have to do to get a job? What jobs do you people want when they leave here? Just holler one out. I assume you guys want to work after this, right? Teacher. You want to be a teacher. 
Well, how do you get to be a teacher after you have your degree? You have to go and apply for it. You have to go and apply for it. So, what is applying? Did you want to say something? Oh, I was just like playing with my hands. Oh, I couldn't hear you. I was just like playing with my hands. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so, what if, what are you doing when you apply? What do you do when you work? What what, what do you get money for? What's that? Being good at your job. Well, you can get money for being bad at your job. I've known people who are bad at their job and still get paid. Is it for like the skill that like the skills that you have? It could be. It depends. It kind of depends on the job, right? So like maybe you get paid for skills that you already possess. Maybe you don't, right? Like depends on the job. But what are you selling? Yourself, your labor. Yeah, you sell your labor. That's the idea. So essentially all of us, rather than having this sort of like constant sort of position, we instead have to sell our labor on the market. Right? We have to sell our labor on the market. So, and like, your skills and stuff may de determine what kind of labor you can get or what prices you can sell it at, right? But essentially, the wages you receive is your time and your labor. So you also sell your time, right? That's what you sell when you go and you work someplace, right? Make sense? Is that what you sell back here? No, you sell goods, right? So we came from selling goods, peasants sold grain, artisans sold whatever they made, right? And people paid them for their products to selling literally our time and our labor, right? So we sell, we sell that off, right? And there's a difference in how we work because of that. How much control did you have over the kinds of activities that you did back here? So where do you work out of usually? So let's say you guys are, in this example, you guys are an artisan of some sort. Where do you work? You work out of your home, right? We refer to this as cottage industry. Has anybody ever heard that term before? Cottage industry is essentially like you make what you, what you do, whatever you make, you make it at home. You make it when you want to make it, right? Thinking about like, Probably the closest thing to this experience would probably be something like being a farmer, right? Like farmers, do, when do farmers work? What's that? Yeah, so they, 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 they work more in harvest, less the rest of the year, but they still work, you know? What determines when and how, like what times they work? So it might be th some things like nature, right? But by and large, like farmers, they work the way that they work, right? Um, you know, they work when they prefer to work. Uh, nobody's standing over them telling them that they have to punch in or punch out, right? There's a constraint, right, to it because like there's the constraint of nature, the constraint of how much work they have to get done, right? Things like that. But it's not controlled in the way that like, I don't know, if you go and you work at you know, McDonald's that you go and you like punch in and you punch out, right? The very different form of work, right? People worked more like farmers and today we don't work that way. And that's largely because we no longer sell products, we sell ourselves, right? So this is the difference in system. Uh, who owns, and this is a big thing within Marxism, and this is because we don't own our means of production. We don't own the means of production. You can't just start selling the products that you make. Even if you make it from beginning and end, you usually can't do that. So like, you know, I can't just sell you guys education. You can't just freelance buy sociology from me. It wouldn't count towards anything. I'm not an accredited institution at myself. You don't come to my home to get explanations of social class in the 19th century. 
you come and you purchase it through a third party institution that I've sold my labor to, right? But they actually own the means of production. They own the buildings, they own the classrooms, they own the projectors, they own all the things that I use, right? They even own the camcorder I bought from Walmart. Um, I bought it and then got reimbursed. But they own it, it's theirs, <laughs> you know? They, you know, they own everything that I use, right? I'm not complaining, like I, I have a, you know, I have a pretty good master. But like, essentially my work is very different from the way in which people would work in the past. And all of our work, for the most part, will be, do, will be done that way, right? You don't get freelance engineers, you don't get freelance, right? Like, generally speaking, we all have to work within our institutions under the control of other people. All that makes sense? Has anyone ever heard the word alienation before? Has anyone ever heard this word? People throw it around sometimes. This is what that actually means. So in, under alienation, right, you become alienated, disconnected from the labor that you do. Right? You no longer have control over it. You're told how to do it. You lose the ability of like being, so essentially you sell your labor off, you alienate it from yourself, right? And it becomes a disconnected thing from you. You don't get to control what products you make, you don't get to control how you make them. All those decisions are made for you. Make sense? Okay. So this is modern. This is not. This is pre-modern. Right, so most, most, at least most of the time that people lived in large states, it resembled something more like this. There's obviously differences across time and space. Right, once we hit modernity, this is, and so the archetype, if you want to think of the archetype of modernity would be factory work. Right, you go into a factory, you do some sort of work, it's often piecemealed, you don't control the whole product, you know, you put your one screw in, it moves down the line, somebody else does it. You, don't ha you didn't design it, you didn't make it, you don't even have to like it, you don't even have to know what you're making all the time, right? It just goes down the line, you do your job, and then it's done, right? You punch in, you punch out, you get your wages, right? And so that's the archetype of how people work, right? Is this true anymore? Is this the archetype? of the here and now. And this kind of gets us into that question. Do we live in the modern anymore? Is this how people work? Are these even what classes we have anymore? And so we almost need to draw different. Does anybody know what happens particularly like so? I think if you went back just as far back as like the 60s and 70s, this would probably hold pretty well still. In which, what, what class would most people belong to? Yeah, most people are right here, right? So in a lot of ways, Marx's description, right? All the peasants, what happens to the peasants? Most of them wind up right here. You know, some of them wind up there, some of them end up middle class, right? But most of them wind up right there, right? A lot of your artisans might end up petite bourgeoisie, they might end up bourgeoisie, right? Whatever, right? Um, but most of your peasants are gonna end up working class. Do you know what happened to the working class in America after the 1970s? Yeah, the working class for the most part disappears. Right? Disappears. Why does it disappear? Why does the working class disappear in America? What don't people do anymore? You can drive to the edge of almost every city in America and see empty, empty, empty buildings, right? 
they stop or factories like close down? Yeah, factory work ended. Well, it's because a lot of stuff is well, globalism is also like TikTok, and so factories are not. Yeah, yeah, this, and that is exactly so it's outsourced, factory work is outsourced. This primarily is where it goes, which gets us also into the question of, do we live in the modern, but the modern just spread out, right? Did it just, did it just pan out into other places? So like there still is a proletariat, they just don't live here, so we just forget that they exist, right? Or is it that it's actually disappearing and we're in a different system, right? So that's kind of the question here, right? But this process is usually referred to as de-industrialization. So what happens to the working class when this disappears? When, when the factory jobs, when all, most of the working class jobs in America disappear? So you may know this. Most of them end up here, some of them end up here. Right? So most of the working class end up working poor. Most of the some of them manage to climb up via things like education programs and stuff like that. Right? In the United States, like some people had managed to get degrees as a result of military service, things like that as well. So some people managed just to move upward, become upwardly mobile. Most became downwardly mobile and they became part of the working class. Does anybody know what's happening right now in terms of the class structure in the United States? Becoming more separated? Yeah, so we talked about social stratification, and so in a lot of ways, this is a different way of describing social stratification. Um, there's one class in particular that, we, that, that looks like it's disappearing from the United States right now. Does anybody know what class that is? this one. It's the middle class. So middle class is your, the likelihood, and not to be depressing, most of you guys came out of what, so, what social class probably because you're here in college. <coughs> What's that? Work. So, somebody came from working class. Most people in college just came out of the middle class. Right? And essentially what colleges do is they allow you to kind of replicate your middle class. We talked about this with replication stuff, right? On, on Wednesday. It allows you to replicate your class standing, right? No offense, but like the probability of people who start out middle class ending up middle class is dropping because there are less middle class jobs in the United States than there was 10 years ago, right? So slowly we are actually outsourcing middle class jobs in a lot of weird ways. So the, this could be things like, you know, before, well, for the by, by and large companies, if they had somebody doing like data work, right, like data processing kind of stuff, they used to all be done here. Now most of it is done abroad. They outsourced it to cheaper labor, right? Uh, even stuff like medical doctors, medical care is being outsourced. Does anybody ever, anybody ever hear a teledoc? Has anybody ever, ever had to use this? No, you guys don't know what this is. A lot of insurance doesn't let you go to the doctor unless you called via teledoc before to see if you could get your prescriptions or whatever treatment you needed outsourced someplace else where it's cheaper. So you literally call up and it's somebody halfway across the world diagnosing you over the phone, right? And a lot of insurance now makes this mandatory, right? This is a great example, right? So, so what is that removing? Essentially, it's removing positions from professionals here in the United States. It's removing work from them, doing it cheaper someplace else. Right, so increasingly this class is the one that's disappearing right now. And there's questions of how far this will go, right? But like in particular, millennials, Gen Z, are ending up significantly poorer than their parents were. And that's largely a result of this sort of decline in the middle class. I know a lot of people that I went to school with who work at restaurants. You know, and not to put too fine a point on it, but that's actually a good part of that is this process, right? Uh, whether this isn't predetermined, so we don't know what's going to happen, right? But uh, right now, it looks like, by and large, what's happening is the middle class is disappearing from the United States, just like the working class did. 
uh, it's going to be very difficult for middle class people to move here, which actually is connected to the gig economy thing that you brought up, right? So like more and more people who started out middle class are doing this sort of piecemealed work without insurance to try to make something close to a middle class living, right? And that's generally people who started out here doing things like, you know, selling stuff online, you know, working for Uber, right? Piecemealing all this kind of stuff together, right? Make sense? Cool. After that very depressing lecture, next week we're going to move to talking about global inequality. And there's questions on whether you can really analyze things from this level, right? That we talked about today. So.